afternoon, everyone. <coughs> um, I'd like to say this was planned, but it wasn't. It's somehow or another, we're short of a program, um, so I apologize that. But if you have a phone and um, you want to look it up, I'll, I'll give it to you. It's e-brevery. Can you believe that? It was planned, which saving trees. So it's um, e b r e v i a r y dot com, and it's the liturgy of the hours um, for dedication of a church. Uh, so if you look up Catholic dedication of a church vespers and e breviary, you will find it. All right, too hard. So if you search in your, in your search engine, search for Catholic Vespers for dedication of a church, you should see a site called eBreviary. And if not, God listens to every prayer and we will get it. Yeah. Did anyone find it? You got it. You got it in Latin. Would you please stand? God, come to my assistance. Lord, make haste to help me. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Please join in singing our opening hymn, number 747, Christ is made the sure foundation, number 747.
A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are fellow citizens with the Holy Ones and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the capstone. Through him, the whole structure is held together and grows into a temple sacred in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place of God in the spirit. Your house, O Lord, must always be a holy place. Alleluia, alleluia. Your house, O Lord, must always be a holy place. Alleluia, alleluia. Forever and ever. Alleluia, alleluia. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Your house, O Lord, must always be a holy place. Alleluia, alleluia. Please stand. response to the intercessions is remember your church Lord our Savior laid down his life so that all God's scattered children might be gathered together in our need let us cry out remember your church Lord 
Lord Jesus, you built your house upon a rock. Strengthen your church with solid and lasting faith. Remember your church, Lord. Lord Jesus, blood and water flowed from your side. Give new life to your church through the sacraments of new and an and a new and an ending covenant. Remember your church, Lord. Lord Jesus, you are in the midst of those who gather in your name. Hear the prayers of your universal church. Remember your church, Lord. Lord Jesus, you prepare a dwelling place in your Father's house for all who love you. Help your church to grow in divine love. Remember your church, Lord. Lord Jesus, you never cast out anyone who comes to you. Open your Father's house to all who have died. Remember your church, Lord. On this day, we ask you to remember St. Boniface, its rich and long history. We give you gratitude for that heritage, and we ask you to bless our future. Remember your church, Lord. And we gather our prayers in the words that Jesus gave us. Let us pray. Father, each year we recall the de dedication of this church to your service. Let our worship always be sincere and help us to find your saving love in this church. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
So I had um, COVID last week and I was in quarantine, which frankly, I kind of enjoyed. <laughs> and um, one of the things I did um, was watch uh, some David Letterman. He's doing interviews. Have you seen that on Netflix? Um, it's called Our Next Guest Needs No Introduction. <laughs> Our Guest Needs No needs no introduction so I want to introduce Father Anthony who needs no introduction and uh, we're very grateful for him helping us to reflect on the extraordinary gift that has been this little community and uh, hopefully it will propel us to be good stewards into the future. Thank you so much Father Anthony. Thank you so much for coming out this afternoon. Um, just a reminder, the title of, the, of this talk is Germans in America and in Brooklyn, the early community of St. Boniface, 1854 to 1872. I thought it would make sense to uh, take that you know, almost 20 year period from the time the church was established, the parish was established until this church was constructed in 1872. Uh, beware of speakers who begin their talks with a series of disclaimers. Since I'm about to do this, do not say later that you are not forewarned. Let me begin by first thanking the committee, who's been organizing ways both to mark and celebrate the 150th, 150th anniversary of the construction of the present church uh, in 1872. This committee includes Mary Beth Flynn, Eleanor Moretta, David Straub, Tracy Garrison Feinberg, Bree Munoz, and of course, Father Mark. Some months ago, they asked me, they kindly asked me to offer a few reflections on this important milestone in the life of this faith community. And what better day to do this than uh, June 5th, which is both the Feast of St. Boniface uh, and Pentecost, the birth of the church. It's also a glorious day outside, so sometimes God is especially good when the calendar just brings everything just perfectly together. When I began the, the conversation with the committee about the focus of this talk, it became pretty clear to all of us how rich this field of study was. And soon it also became readily apparent to them and to me that this talk would by necessity have to be quite narrow in scope. First disclaimer. Over the course of the, par of the, the parish's history of a, now 168 years, Clearly, a series of different communities have come to make this their spiritual home. And many forces, forces of push and pull, economic, demographic, cultural, political, even ecclesiastical, have shaped each of these communities over the decade as one left and another sort of took its place. Thus, for our reflection today, I just want to look at that, really that first worshiping community of, of St. Boniface. This group of overwhelmingly German immigrants who founded the parish in 1854 and seemed to be its core community of both laity and clergy for the next several decades into the early 20th century. Uh, now the second disclaimer. Now this disclaimer comes by way of a story. A good friend of mine, now deceased, studied history on the graduate level many decades ago at Fordham University in the Bronx. One of the courses he took was entitled France Since 1870 and was taught by a professor, shall we say, of the old school. While this teacher had a strong reputation, as the semester was drawing to a close, he had still yet to discuss any topic with French history after 1870. Eventually, one of the graduate students, not my friend, finally screwed up enough courage to ask when they would finally get to the matter at hand. Somewhat annoyed, the professor brushed him off and said, you need to know the background first. So I promise not to be as extreme as this crusty old professor, but we, I think it's helpful to have some background before we get to the subject at matter. And also, by way of also a note of background, just two things I want to talk about in terms of geography or civic civic life. Okay, so 
you know, when we, obviously, we talk about New York City, we mean the five boroughs, but that wasn't a reality until 1898. Before 1898, Brooklyn, Kings County, where we are now, was really a series of villages and towns, and, and one city, Brooklyn. So um, when I talk about New York City, I am going to be a little bit anachronistic in talking about it as we understand it t today. Um, also, curiously enough, what neighborhood are we standing in right now? Well, I guess if you ask the developers, they'll tell you one thing. We might say something else. It seemed that this area was even known as Brooklyn Heights in the 19th century. Clearly, in our minds, Adams Street clearly separates that, but Brooklyn Heights seem to be considered even down here. The term downtown Brooklyn is very much a 20th century term. Um, the city of Brooklyn was in, incorporated in 1834. And interestingly enough, over the first two decades of its life, 1834, to just about the time St. Boniface was founded, by 1854, 1855, Brooklyn was the third largest city in America. New York, of course, across the river, and Philadelphia right after it. In discussing the German-American community of New York in the middle of the 19th century, I will uh, be defining its, its geography broadly to include, um, as I said, you know, here in Brooklyn as well as Manhattan. You know, the, um, there was ferry service from Manhattan from the 1630s. There was regular ferry service to Brooklyn. But with the invention of the steam engine in 1807 and steam-powered ferries shortly thereafter, there really was a lot of movement of people between Brooklyn and Manhattan. So the German community would have benefited from that easily to move quickly around the city. Um, the middle of the 19th century, after the Irish, the second largest ethnic group among Catholics in New York City were the Germans. As German Americans, interestingly enough, they were a minority three times over, first in the general population, secondly in the local Catholic community, and then thirdly within the New York's German American community, Catholics were a minority within that community. Perhaps about one third of the population of the German American community in New York was Catholic, reflecting the fact that about 80% of pre-Civil War German immigrants to the United States came from areas um, that were Bavaria and Rhineland, areas that had some Catholics in them, but were not exclusively Catholic. The other two-thirds of New York's German population were divided amongst Lutherans, members of the Reformed churches, Jews, socialists, and freethinkers. We don't hear much about free thinkers. The latter were aggressively sectarian in their secularism, and they even founded their own network of churches and parochial schools to try to inculcate their idea of secularism. German Americans to the US in the 19th century tended to be somewhat better off economically than the Irish who came. And they came to dominate certain trades and industries, such as tailors, shoemakers, bakers, butchers, and not surprisingly, brewers, the most successful of whom formed the elite of the German community in Manhattan and Brooklyn. Now, the bulk of the German-American community in this more widely defined New York City lived in three neighborhoods. Uh, Kleine Deutschland, which was little Germany, which we would now call the Lower East Side, it was about 250 city blocks from 14th Street in the north um, down to Division Street on the south, the Bowery on the west, and the East River. According to one estimate, at mid-century, that was the third largest German city in the world, if you understood it as a separate city, just behind Vienna and Berlin. Now, there was also a sizable German-American community up in Yorkville on the Upper East Side. And then the third one was here in Brooklyn in Williamsburg, with smaller numbers in Bushwick and, Green, and Greenpoint. Remember, those were villages at that point. Um, it's also interesting to note that at the end of the 19th century, the German-Americans in Brooklyn 
were the most successful, the most powerful, and the wealthiest ethnic group in the city. Now, what about the German-American community in what is now downtown Brooklyn? <clears throat> I have to say, I found very little scholarship overall on the topic of the German community in Brooklyn. I don't think it was all that large, as I said, in Williamsburg at this point. And because it was so large on the Lower East Side, it's not surprising that scholars were more attracted to that. There were just more resources, more documents, so they were more interested in Kleine Deutschland, the Lower East Side. Um, but I did find one, one thing that I found, I think, interesting. Now, Germans were renowned, you might know, for being prolific founders of voluntary associations, Vereins in German, associations. Brooklyn's German community was no different, and they built all sorts of gathering spots, including athletic and social clubs for their communities. One of the most influential of these German-American associations was the Germania Club, which was at the corner of Atlantic and Clinton Streets and was founded in 1859. It quickly outgrew that space and about 20 years later, its members built a much larger and more impressive edifice on the corn on Skimmerhorn Street near Smith Street, costing at that point the princely sum of $130,000, which roughly would be maybe $5 million in today's dollars. I think the fact that these two locations of the club must have de demonstrated that there was an F um, a presence of German Americans living in what we now call the greater downtown Brooklyn community, as well as Williamsburg and Greenpoint, etc. It's also interesting to note that um, in 1907, so it was founded 1859, it moved about 20 years later. In 1907, the club closed and sold its building. Um, it was eventually knocked down in order to build the independent subway system, all the letter lines. And the central court building, the one there now on, in, built in, in 1932, is where, which is now a residence, is where it is. And I did find, and I'll mention this later, that um, the number of baptisms here at St. Boniface had declined dramatically by the early 20th century, uh, which shows that people were moving again. Uh, people are always moving, and you know, this parish has seen that. As for the spiritual needs of this German Catholic community, as far back as 1808, German-speaking parishioners at St. Peter's on Barclay Street had petitioned their bishop, who was at that point in, Bal um, in Baltimore, for their own parish. St. Peter's on Barclay Street was founded in 1785, so it was about 20, 30 years old, uh, 20 years old at that point. And sometime priests, sometimes priests from St. Peter's on Barclay Street would come across the river to the area around where St. James is to celebrate Mass, either in people's homes or in, in bars and things like that. People from Brooklyn would have to go across the river to go to Mass on Sunday, but back then, in the winter, the river was pretty much frozen over for much of the time. So it was very hard to get across the river when it was frozen. Um, although they petitioned for a German-speaking priest, now obviously the Mass was in Latin, but the, but the sermon was in German and everything else would have been in German, all the conversations with the priest, so you did need a German-speaking priest. It would take some time, another almost 20, um, almost. 20, 20 years or so before someone would actually come to respond to that. Um, just by way of comparison, already in 1741 there was a German-speaking priest for the community in Philadelphia, and the first German parish was established there in 1787. In, um, in Baltimore they got its first German parish in 1799. Now, the ministry to German Catholics in the New York, City, in New York City really comes about because of the chance arrival of someone, Father Joseph Raffiner. He was 48 years old when he came to New York City, but he was actually on his way to Cincinnati. He wasn't ordained a priest until he was 40, which would have been very old for that time. He had already been a physician and an army surgeon in his native Austria. 
uh, and then he volunteered to come to America to work with German immigrants in the Midwest. On his way to Cincinnati, he, um, he stopped and met the one and only Bishop of New York so far who was an Irish. Every other Bishop of New York either was born in Ireland or had a parent or grandparent born in Ireland, including Cardinal Dolan. One of his grandparents was born in Ireland. The only one who wasn't was John Dubois, a Frenchman. And he was able to convince Father Raffiner to stay in New York. Um, just by way of uh, context, um, when the Diocese of New York was established in 1808, 1808 it, it included the entire state of New York and half of New Jersey. So that was the state, uh, and they had 15 priests to serve that whole territory. Once Father Raffiner accepted Bishop Dubois' invitation to stay in New York, his first order of business was to find a permanent home for the German Catholics in Manhattan. He began celebrating Mass in a rented carpenter's uh, studio shop, a former Baptist church on the Lower East Side, but eventually in 1834 he purchased four lots from John Jacob Astor at 2nd Street between 1st Avenue and Avenue A. A few years later, in 1836, the first German parish was established named St. Nicholas. But things sort of went downhill from there. Um, he got into a bitter and in interminable dispute with the lay trustees of the parish, so he quit. He quit as pastor and moved across the river in 1840, where he started a new parish, Most Holy Trinity Parish in Williamsburg, which for many years was known as the German Cathedral of Brooklyn. While remaining a pastor of Most Holy Trinity until his death in 1861, so more than two decades, he was instrumental in founding eight other German parishes in Kings County. Um, in order to uh, serve the growing and geographically expanding German-American community, around 1850, Father Raffiner founded a mission church called St. Francis in the Fields, which was located at Putnam and Bedford Avenues in what is now Bedford-Stuyvesant. That would have been the closest, if you look at a map, that would have been the closest place to Germans living around here to go to Mass on Sunday. Um, and, and that's really where the core community that started St. Boniface, they would have been going up there. That group in 1853 approached Father Raffiner with the idea to establish a, a community in this area. As it turns out, that, so this is 1853, as it turns out, just a few months earlier, as they seem to have approached him in the fall of 1853, just a few months earlier in late July, the Pope established Brooklyn at its own diocese. So July of 1853, Pope Pius IX established Brooklyn at his own diocese, which is the entire geographic Long Island, what we now know as Brooklyn, Queens, Nassau, Suffolk counties. Uh, but put the cathedral in the city of Brooklyn. Not surprisingly, it was the third largest city in America at that point. Um, the Pope named uh, a New York priest, John Lachlan, as the first bishop. He was a native of County Down in the north of Ireland, but he was ordained a priest for New York, and he was currently working at what we now call Old St. Patrick's Cathedral on Mulberry and Mott Streets. He was also the Vicar General. And surely, one of, in what was one of his first acts as bishop, Lachlan gave his blessing to the plans to start a community for German Catholics here in downtown Brooklyn. These people moved very quickly, and this was before zoning laws and all that. <laughs> they quickly purchased a former Episcopal church, and I know we know a lot of this. I was able to kind of fill it out a little bit more. A St. Thomas Episcopal Church on Willoughby and Bridge Streets that was probably only about five years, uh, f uh, seven years old at that point for about $4,500. Um, and then January 29th, 1854, Bishop Lachlan dedicated the church, placing it under the patronage of St. Boniface, the great eighth century martyr bishop and great apostle to the Germans. It's interesting to note that both St. Peter's on Barclay Street, St. James, Pro Cathedral, a few blocks away, and St. Boniface, all were started by lay people, not priests. And that's not 
uncommon in the 19th century. It were lay people who took the lead in starting to organize, and sometimes they would reach out, they would start the church, and then they would go out and look for a priest to serve them. Um, the original parish community numbered about 200 people. The founders of St. Boniface, then their names still ring resoundingly German to the ears. And here's a few just to kind of uh, tickle your ears. Blinking, Blinkinger, Engel, Fink, Brunning, Kitchenlaub, Rausch, and Wickenschoff. Not surprising, the first priests who served the community at St. Boniface had similar sounding names. What is surprising is how many there were in the parish's early years and how relatively short their tenure was. I have a theory about that, but I'll share that in a minute. So the first pastor was Father Maurice Ramschauer. He was a Bavarian Benedictine. He just served for the first three years, 1854 to 1857. Next came Father Bonaventure Keller, a Franciscan from Austria. He was only here a few months before he got sick and went out to Wisconsin to convalesce with his order. He was succeeded by another Franciscan, Father Joseph Brunemann, whose tenure was short also, lasting about a year. Fortunately, the next pastor, an Austrian Benedictine, Father John Hummel, served a full six years when in 1864 um, he returned to Europe. Um, and then in a minute, we're going to see a lot more. Um, now, why is that? Why were there so many changes? I, it was, I think people were moving around a lot in that part of the 20th and 19th century. Immigrants were moving around a lot. I mean, you might know May 1st was the day everyone changed apartments. Uh, a lot of Germans first came to New York, but a lot of them went to the Midwest. A lot of these priests wound up going to the Midwest where the German population was much larger and also much more um, rural, obviously. Um, uh, bishops back then had a lot more power to move around priests. Priests didn't have, had practically no rights under canon law. That didn't change for many decades. So I think that was a, a reason too. But obviously, there is, we have no, there's no documentary evidence left why, why, the reasons why each one, other than someone saying he wasn't well, kept moving on. Father Hummel was succeeded by Father Michael Decker, who was born in Germany but educated in the U.S. He was here for five years, resigned because of ill health. However, his time with the community would prove to be pivotal, as it was he who began the plans for the construction of this church. Father Decker. Um, now after him came a venerable laundry list of names. Fathers Halber, Berschneider, Oberschneider, and Beriffi. All those in three years. And again, we don't know why, but the, the lay community must have been pretty strong because they weathered all these changes. It was, it was during Beriffi's brief pastorate that in 1871 the cornerstone was laid and blessed by Bishop Lachlan. Of course, the church was completed and dedicated the next year in 1872. By then, the pastor was, had already changed, Peter de Burge, who, like all the others, had been born in Europe. The total cost for the construction of the church was $44,000. I find that if you go on Google, you can find one of these calculators to translate if you knew money, but I feel like over a century and a half, it kind of becomes like almost worthless because what a dollar could do back then is now, but it's a number. Um, you know, it's interesting to note that when the, when the parish was founded in 1854, they had already established a school in the basement of St. Thomas. Um, they had 50 students when it opened and a faculty of one. I guess the New York City schools are dropping their class sizes to about 22. But God bless this laywoman. This is how she would describe. Unfortunately, her name is lost to the mist of time. The children were taught by a good Catholic laywoman who did everything possible to Americanize them and instill a love for God in their hearts. Um, so opens, opening school in the basement of the original church. Over the next 17 years, the number of students began to increase, and then two other lay teachers were hired. 
uh, eventually to accommodate the ex this expanding population of students, they, after the sale of the form of the old church, an old colonial mansion was purchased at the corner of Willoughby and Duffield Street. And it was used as both the school and the rectory. Um, at the same time, Father de Burge was able to convince the Dominican sisters at the Holy Cross Convent here in Brooklyn to send some nuns to work in the school. Now, barely 20 years earlier, four Dominican sisters from Regensburg, Germany, had been sent to New York to teach in the German parishes in, Manha in the schools in the German parishes in Manhattan here in Brooklyn. Um, before they arrived, they purchased a building in the neighborhood, I'm not sure where it is or where it was, that was once owned by the Loft Candy Corporation. Now I asked some people before and they do remember Loft Candy. I don't know where this convent was. It was quickly renovated and turned into residential space. The first superior of the convent was Sister Michael Neuer, who had been born in Bavaria in 1845, came to this country as a 21-year-old young woman. She joined the sisters that year, and four, five or four years later, she was the superior of the convent here in Brooklyn. Eventually, that building proved to be inadequate, so in 1882, a new school and rectory was completed. I, would, I think that's what we knew as Newman Hall and what the, where we used to live in the rectory there. I was just talking to Father Mark before, before the service. I know we have some, there's been some tradition here that what part of it was the convent. I don't think it was, but I could, you'd, I'd really have to go down a long rabbit hole to, to either confirm or deny that. I did find one little interesting little anecdote. On Sunday, August 27, 1883, they, um, when they sold the old uh, church, they were able to um, build the new convent. And I'm sorry, when they eventually built the new one, uh, there was, it was a cost of $17,000 and they had a debt on it. So in late summer 1883, a, a picnic fundraiser was held at a place called Philip Cox Bay View Park. I don't think anyone knows what that is. I did a little research. I think it's where the uh, Home Depot is now, over in that area. There seemed to be a big park there because I can find in old issues of the Brooklyn Eagle of different groups having parties out there. Um, you know, the main historical record that we have for the life of the parish during this time are the sacramental records baptism records and marriage records. I mentioned again to Father Mark, I don't, there are no confirmation records from the 19th century. I don't know when that changed, when you, it was the expectation to write down confirmations. In 1854, there were 48 baptisms at St. Boniface, so it's first year. Um, by 1864, there was 122. So obviously the numbers are going up rapidly. So you could see that this, why the school was growing. By 1907, I, I referred to this earlier, it was down to 47, and about a third of them had last names that were no longer German, either Anglo-Irish names. Now, um, I'm gonna raise some questions here. I don't have the answers to them, but I think they're interesting questions to think about. So if you think, obviously, I'm talking about here just this spiritual life of the people, their church life, but obviously they have a, we have lives that are more than just that. So think of the, probably the two biggest issues facing the American people in the 1850s and 1860s. Obviously the Civil War comes in 1861. Prior, that, prior to that is abolitionism. Okay, now we happen to be standing here, where we are here, about a mile from here, at Plymouth Church in Brooklyn Heights, and Henry Ward Beecher, the greatest of the abolitionist preachers. Um, there were a lot of places, as we know, on the Underground Railroad in this neighborhood. Obviously, I have, there, it'd be very hard to have, to have any sense of what um, 
what the first parishioners of St. Boniface, what they thought about abolitionism, or, what they, or how they were, were involved in the Civil War. Um, I can point out that um, German Catholics tended to be more, they tended to vote more democratic at that time, and they were also less likely to enlist for military service than other German immigrants. You might also know, I only learned this recently, a couple of years ago when I read an article about this, but um, there were many reasons why Catholics were not involved in abolitionism. One of them was that many abolitionists tended to be nativists and violently anti-Catholic. So sometimes the same people who were kind of supporting, you know, rightly so, the rights of enslaved people in the South with some ones who were the same violently anti-Catholic and anti-nativist. How you could bring those things together, that's a whole other conversation for another day. Very complex about that. Um, um, the other big thing that would have been a topic, I think, amongst the German-American parishioners of this parish would have been German unification. Now, when the first, there was no Germany really until 1870 after the Franco-Prussian War, that just to go back to that earlier joke about uh, France since 1870, once the French lost the French, the Franco-Prussian War, that's really when they had to regroup themselves. Um, if someone really wanted to do a deep dive, um, the German-American press in the 19th century was enormous. There were 61 German American, German Catholic newspapers in the United States. Nine of them were daily newspapers. Daily newspapers published for the German Catholic community in the United States in German. Germans held on to their language fiercely, as you might know, up until the First World War. There were still about 500 Catholic parochial schools that were operating exclusively or partly in German up until the First World War. And then after the First World War, they practically all disappeared because of the anti-German sentiment that, that was brought up, you know. Um, though already that was starting to, to fray as the immigrants were getting more and more assimilated. The Bishop of Milwaukee, who was a, was a German name, um, blanking on it right now, in the 1880s, he mandated that the children in his parochial schools had to learn their catechism both in English and in German. He saw that the children were already, as we've seen this so many ways, were kind of putting that behind them. Um, between 1906, and this is also an interesting thing, and I'm, this I'm coming to a close. Between 1906 and 1916, the number of German parishes in the United States were halved. So already in the early part of the 20th century. And um, just maybe a, a definition. A German parish or an Italian national parish were parishes that did not have boundaries. Anyone who spoke that language had that immigrant, had that ethnic identity could go there. But already by the early 20th century, these German parishes were becoming territorial parishes. And maybe just to close, and then obviously if anyone has any questions, um, I think that there are four phases in the life of St. Boniface. Um, I, I could argue, so the first phase is what we talked about today, 1854 to 1872. You know, why those years? Well, obviously 1854, a parish established, 1872, this church is established. I think it's still solidly German, language, identity, all that. Then I could, you could argue 1872, I think, to 1918. I think that would be another kind of logical place to cut it off. 1918, the end of World War I, you're already starting to see massive changes in this neighborhood by the early 20th century. One of the most distinct was because it was in 1908 where you had subway service between Manhattan and Brooklyn. And that leads to a tremendous amount of change and building here in downtown Brooklyn. And more and more people leaving the neighborhood as it becomes more and more of a commercial district. The next phase, I would argue, would go um, 1918 to 1947. Um, why 1947? That's when the school closes in 1947. And I think that really shows um, the, um, 
The school closed not because there were a declining number of Catholics in the country or anything like that. It just showed the neighborhood, there were very few people living around here anymore. St. Peter's Church on Barclay Street, their school closed in 1940, which shows you by that point nobody was living around there, tiny numbers of people. And then I think the next phase would be 1947 to 1990. Obviously, the oratory comes here in 1990, but the other thing is the building of Metrotech around that time. So I think that would be, and then obviously you could argue from 1990 to the present, so maybe five phases in the life of the parish. Um, you know, if, if somebody was being very enterprising, uh, you could do something like this. You could look at, in the baptismal register, sometimes they list the, um, the address of the child being baptized. In the marriage register, they do tend to list the address of where the bride and groom, and back then, none of them lived together. So it makes it a lot easier to do genealogy because you see where they're coming from. Uh, you really could do a deep dive and look at the census records to see where their family was living. Now that obviously would take an enormous amount of work to do that. But if you really wanted, and some historians have done these micro histories, they'll take a parish and really go and do an enormous deep dive into it with the idea if you learn a lot about this one parish, then probably it's true in other parishes too, and then you start to, to kind of pull up. Um, uh, the diocesan archives, which the, obviously the diocese of Brooklyn has, has a fairly thin file on most parishes. How documents wind up there is kind of uh, per chance. There's no rhyme or reason to it. They tend to have more financial records, and even those are very spotty at best. And over the going back to 2004, with the 150th anniversary of that, a lot of those were mined and put together in those beautiful um, newsletters that were published, which so many of you remember. Um, and any, any questions, again, I, a lot of it I might not be able to answer, but I could give maybe a little more broader context about it. Please. So, so that, I, I, do, I, I don't know that. It was clearly went into the earlier 20th century where the, so, it would have been, the sermon would have been in German, the notices would have been in German, uh, but I, would, I, I did not, because that was a little beyond my view, I think I didn't, but I, but I got the sense by, by the early 20th century that was already ending. Again, because I think um, the community was being dispersed. And also, remember, German immigration is enormous between the 1840s and the 1880s, but after the 1880s, it really starts to slow down, so you have just think about it, you only have the older people speaking German, and then eventually when they die out, their children don't speak. Uh, and just that little line about um, that lay woman trying to Americanize them, though I get the sense it was, the school was taught in German, so they hadn't, gotten, they hadn't left the language yet, and that's interesting. In the back, yeah, Jim. Yeah, this seemed like it was a piece of property owned by the Loft family, and that's what they, they bought it. Marita? Um, yes, I how many were in the past? So, 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 I, that, so that's why I, I was really focusing on this. Obviously, the number had dropped dramatically by that point because of um, the depopulation, you know, of this neighborhood. Eleanor? No, the um, I my yeah, the the this I think this is the this was the only German church, sort of this side of Brooklyn going south that way. They tended to be much more in those neighborhoods. Um, 
uh, there was, and some of them were closed, I mean, some of them were closed in the 1970s, actually. They, they, they were no longer many Germans there left, but they still were technically German parishes. Um, yeah, uh, sorry. And, uh, is it a German name or no? Oh. Oh, wow. Mary? Yeah, but, it, but you're right, but it was, you're right. I mean, and the German Catholic schools kind of all went out of existence or one, because of all that anti-German sentiment. Oh, is that right? So, I mean, you know, New York was the biggest point of entry. New York, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Boston. You know, some ethnic groups tended to keep moving. You know, they say that, I, I remember reading this year, a, a, a Jewish person in the U.S., an American Jew, 90% of them can trace at least one ancestor who lived on the Lower East Side. I mean, that's amazing if you think about it. The Germans, they came to New York, but they were much more likely to go west because a lot of them came with some capital, like some money or some tools. They may have been farmers back at home and they wanted to go out there. The Irish were different for all sorts of reasons. In fact, they tried, there were all these schemes to try to do Irish colonization societies out in the West to, to give them farmland and it didn't work. The Irish generally, because back at home it was such a densely populated country, the Irish didn't like, they always said, there was an expression, they didn't want to live so far as you couldn't live, look over the hedge and see your neighbor, where the Germans were used to living kind of more at a distance. Um, obviously, Dory, as a, a German-American from, from Wisconsin, that was the case. I just think they, um, you know, it was just the largest, the largest point of entry. And that's the reason why Washington, D.C. has almost no ethnic communities, because it wasn't a port of entry. So there's really no, uh, up until, until the late 20th century, later 20th century. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for your time and attention today. Uh, Father Anthony um, alluded to a, a, a little committee that we put together and uh, we're actually producing a document uh, with that with some of the history and uh, hopefully we'll have that soon. Eleanor, are you there? Yeah, there you go. Eleanor and David Straub and Bridget and Tracy and um, Mary Beth and myself have contributed some articles to that and hopefully we'll be able to give that to you soon. I have some more copies of the Stations of the Cross that we produced for the 150th. If you didn't get one, I'll bring the box out here and you're most welcome to... Now you're free to go home. Huh? <laughs> we'll stay for 6 o'clock Mass. Right. <laughs> no what? No pretzels and beers. Yeah, no, sorry. Yeah. All right. Thanks everyone. Thanks again, Father Anthony. Thank you so much. Thank you.